So to begin, ladies, thank you. Appreciate you being here. I guess we'll start with you know the reason why we want to talk about this. Why do you think rates in self-harm have increased over the past couple of years when it comes to teens, boys and girls? So many intersecting factors. Um, academic pressures, economic pressures on families, sense of disconnection with social media and devices kind of taking over for some families. Um, I would say those are a couple things that have happened. And I think with that disconnection, we see at school when kids are before the pandemic, when kids were among each other, just not knowing how to connect because they're so used to just being in a device, that skill has really been stifled. And so then with the pandemic, now having to be isolated, uh, coming out of that, going back into a school setting, there's just a lot of confusion on how to connect. And it might not always be a thought of self-harm. It could just be depression, anxiety. What are some things that teens are facing this day and age? I, can I definitely comment on anxiety? I mean, I, I've been in the field, in my field for a really long time, and anxiety was not a thing in the early 2000s. It was just not something that you saw kids experiencing, talking about, none of that. And then when we got to about, I'd say 2013 or so, it, it really just went through the roof. I heard more kids using the word anxiety and at younger ages. And so that definitely became something that kids were aware of. Not that it didn't exist be before, but being able to put a name to it and being able to describe it in a way that someone else would understand, this is what I'm experiencing. It just, and I'm sure Katie can speak to what happened around that time, um, what, what was happening with technology around that time that really changed the way that kids were experiencing walking down the halls out of school. I think too the cost of college tuition, especially when you look at the at-risk group in Arizona, boys 15 to 17, so the cost of college, about 20 years ago we started to see that go up and then SAT, ACT, college admissions got more competitive, so pressure, academic pressure and athletic pressure starts in fourth, fifth grade. And so we're starting to see that anxiety creep up academically and athletically as well. Why do you think kids maybe don't want to share with their parents or share with others how they might be feeling? I think it goes to, to parents. A lot of kids um, seem to feed off of you know their personality, the, the expressions and things that they're saying. And I, I find even myself in my style of parenting that it's easy for us to talk about our past saying you you know when there's talk, when the kid is trying to explain what they're feeling um, we tend to minimize what they're feeling or we're being dismissive to say it, you're making a big deal you're try being an adult and all of that and what parents don't realize is they're missing the boat when the child is trying to open up those are those opportunities that we need to be listening more than speaking um, that's a that's a mistake I've made as a parent and I think that um, they need validation. We don't, it doesn't remove our role to be a parent, but at the same time is that if we don't listen, they will be talking to strangers. And the fact is, is that teachers are overworked and our counselors are overworked. So sometimes they can't give the time that the child needs. That might be counseling or support with their pastor or a trusted adult, but it's with social media, it's made it so simple to get answers, but it's, it's the quality of the answers that they're getting they're there, they still don't, um, they don't, the children don't have that experience of whether it's good advice or bad advice. And so, yes, parents want to be the ones that the kids come to, but if you're not available, they know that and they're gonna go to the next person. I think there's relatability too, like the digital age has brought on such a vast divide between how parents grew up and how kids are growing up. And so parents really need to do a deep dive into having their child identify the feelings and then having, as Paola said, that open communication. They want to please their parents. And so sometimes as a child, you experience a first, a first breakup, a first scholarship decline, a first college admissions decline, like a first just anxious moment with a friendship group that excluded you. So I think we forget the intensity of those moments when we were offline, but now they have the in-person crush 
and then they have the online avatar persona that they've created and everybody's watching. So I think parents need to understand there's a vast divide and the sooner you can close that divide, the better you will have a relationship with your child. I think it's important that we also not forget that kids get in trouble for things and there's a fear of getting in trouble. And so with being digitally connected, there's so many opportunities to come across something intentionally or unintentionally. And I don't want to tell my parent because I think I'll get in trouble. And even if I said I wasn't looking for it, will they believe me? And so that, I think that that's a, another layer that it, it just exists in a different way than it did for the parents of those youth. And with these fears and perceptions and other people and other things at their fingertips, other outlets they could have, how do you approach these tough conversations with teens in your life or your kids? Well, with my kids, I do something called car talk. And so when we're on the way to school, these are the conversations that come up. We actually film them because it just brings in that element you know, it's, it's something that they're already familiar with. And so we film it so that they can go back and watch it. We can all pay attention. And sometimes I even uh, post some of them. So I just try to keep that connection and keep it relevant in having those conversations because we do it regularly, they're familiar. So they, they understand that we're gonna talk about these things. I'm glad Jeronda brought that up because um, car talk, I call it drive time. Drive time, I stress to all my families. I work with families for a living and the thing is, don't send someone else to drive your kids to school. Make the time to drive them to their practices, pick them up from their practices, take them to their doctor's appointments, anything. I find that raising my two kids, most of those intimate conversations happen at drive time. And the reason being, I think, is because our eyes are facing forward and we're not having to look eyeball to eyeball. Are they mad at me? Are they, you know, they're they don't want to search for that. They, they want to be honest and that way they're do doing, doing this. I find they're more honest in their conversation when they don't have to look at one another and they're shoulder to shoulder. And things are coming out of left field and sometimes, you know what, we'll pull over. You, you know, like, let's talk about that. The kids meet late for school, but that moment comes and goes and that is the opportunity to to have that honest conversation. If they miss half a day of school, this is far more important to find out what's ailing them inside and use that time wisely. I, I can't tell you how many times I've, I've ran into those important conversations through drive time. And, you know, sometimes especially teenagers, they might think, oh, it's not cool to hang out or talk or spend any time with my parent at all. How would you maybe approach kids who are in that phase of their life? food. That's how I was able to reach my kid is through food. Hey, we just um, put your stuff down. Let's go grab an ice cream or let's go do this. You know, um, it doesn't have to cost a lot. Heck, I took my kids to Sonic and buy the little, the, the happy hour and um, food. I used to um, go to their rooms. I'm going to be going to bed. Would you like me to bring you a snack? That's not because I'm you know, just I'm a doormat or something. It's just to show love. That that's just showing love. And they're like, "Can you bring me some M and M's? Can you bring me an ice cream?" That gave me permission to give it to them and stand in their doorway and talk to them for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever it may be. And that is a, so. It's kind of like drive time. That's an opportunity, and that worked really, really well in communicating with both my kids is through food. I think staying relevant, like there's just so much going on and like sitting down and playing the video game with them. You know, it's easy for parents to be like, why is he doing that? Why is he burning his brain out on the video game? But actually playing with them and understanding what they're attracted to, what's the new trend, tell me more about this. They love when you take an interest in what they have an interest in. Even if you aren't super interested, you're actually spending time you know, what are you attracted to? Why did, Why is this so fun? Show me. Um, they really want you to be a part of their life. And not forgetting that they still are kids and letting them be that. You know, we might have a kid who's the same height or taller than us and so our expectation is that they should have thought processes that are like adults, but they don't yet. So give them that leeway to just be a kid and grow into whatever it is they're going to grow into. I showed up the last day of school with a bowl of snow and <laughs> literally pelted teachers and students on the curb with snow and everyone had a blast. Had a blast just being kids. 
could I have gotten in trouble for that? Well, the teachers, <laughs> <laughs> the teachers would have determined that, but the teachers were coming into my car, like taking snowballs because we're, it, we're just having fun, just having fun and letting kids be kids. It's so important to stay there for a while. And I think what, you, what, you, what Katie just mentioned about video games, what I learned after um, my son passed away, I didn't really get the video game thing, but what I come to learn is the kids that he had relationships for five and six years that he's been playing with for such a long time, these are true friendships. And I think that there needs to be some more education out there for his parents to understand about the video game world. So some people think it's really scary that it causes a lot of these issues that kids have um, but there are real, tr they are real friendships. Um, and the reason why we know that is I, my brother was a guardian since he was two years old until the day that he died, that um, he vetted these people to make sure they're not adults and so forth. And when we had these conversations after his passing, they were talking about things that I didn't even know about my own son. And just that they cared for him, the fact that um, they got to talk about real life stuff. So it's not just gaming. These, it's just like if they were sitting on a couch conversing with one another. These are true friendships. Some of them, um, he played with a bunch of kids in Canada and in Florida. And um, so I just wanted to put that out there because I don't think a lot of parents know that. I learned after the fact. So I didn't validate those friendships. I just thought you're just spending too much time and so on. So we're used to, when we were kids, we play outside. These kids are playing video games, but not all of it is bad. But having a guardian that will vet the games and so forth is a good idea. Um, it was very helpful, you know, with my son. He was playing more like the Minecraft or playing um, Destiny, but not some of these other gory type games. But they're friendships. And how early do you think these conversations should be starting with your kids? You know, this isn't light stuff if talking about, you know, hurting yourself or potentially hurting others and just, you know, the weight of stress. How early would you, or do you think I mean, parents need to be yeah, talking about this? It's never too early. I mean, you can start talking three, four, five, you know, just mm -hmm. about my brain and how my brain feels, how my body's feeling, you know, and those are incremental conversations. Sharonda is fantastic at teaching those skills, but really incrementally as they age, kind of adding in more details, just like you would talk about sex or you would talk about drugs and alcohol. Each of those conversations can be approached at an early age and then filling in details as they age with you. And I have young kids. I mean, my youngest is six, and we've been having these conversations since he was at least three. I mean, he was a part of it, in it, because my kids range now in age from six to 14. So as they get older, it sounds a little bit different, but he would know as a three-year-old that sometimes your body hurts and you might get an owie on your body, but sometimes your head and your heart hurts and you might get an owie there. That, that might not feel so good. And asking him, how does your heart feel? How does your head feel? How, how do your feelings feel? And it's really interesting the way that little kids describe it, um, which might then spark something if you have other kids, for the other kids to say like, oh, okay, yeah, I do feel like that. or. I have felt like that before. So it becomes like this total, for me, I have four kids, so it becomes like this total reteaching moment that it keeps going in this cycle. But with my first, same thing, starting when he was really young, just talking about just feelings in general and, and making sure that he understood that if you're not feeling good physically or you're not feeling good inside of here, if this hurts inside of here, we need to talk about that. And sometimes I might feel like that too. And is it okay for me to tell you that if, if um, my heart's not feeling so good today or my head's not feeling so good today? So early, early, early. And I, I think that would you find since you have four kids that um, when you are getting reinforcement from your eldest on down and so there's that trust too so it's that compound effect and we all look at our siblings for answers to things and so you feel that that's taken place for you? I do and and sometimes they will pay attention now to the facial expressions and so they they are learning at home so then when they see it with their friends they'll even come to me and say I don't think some this person was feeling okay today or or when I ask what was your favorite thing or your least favorite thing at school today they'll tell me something about someone else someone hurt someone's feelings today. And so then they, they just become very observant of their environment. So having those conversations early are really important, even for just overall, just as who am I as a citizen and contributing to my classroom commu community or my school community. I think it's really important to have that. What did you call it, Paula? Like, like the re, I don't know what the word was. 
was that you reaffirming, reinforcement. Reinforcement, yeah, reinforcement. Reinforcement. Yeah. Well, and Shonda really hit on like when we talk about self harm and suicide prevention. It's really, you know, when someone is feeling like they're going to harm themselves or harm themselves to completion of a suicide, it's really a narrowing of their lens, right? I have to get out of this inescapable pain. And so if at young ages we're really outlining for them, like what would you do if you were in so much pain emotionally? What are your five strategies? I can journal, I can go run the stairs, I can go punch my punching bag, like whatever that looks like. It's really outlining those strategies at a young age. So when they hit that middle school, high school age that is so crucial, that the, the lens is wider. Like this is my emotional blueprint of when I feel like this, this is what I go do. We do that for academics, but we tend as parents in schools not to really talk about widening the path, and that's really where we need to head. And what are some signs parents could look for if maybe their child or teen isn't opening up? What are some signs or actions parents can take to really try and understand what's going on? I, I have one that oh. stands out um, specifically because I one of the things I learned about my son is that um, he had what you call concealed depression. So on the outside, it looks totally fine. He, he napped a lot since he was a child. And so sleeping a lot, not eating well or not eating at all, there's a lot of those signs. That was all normal and that didn't send up a red flag. What should have sent up a red flag um, was he was a gamer since he was like two years old. And so in that, a month prior to him dying, he, he stopped playing video games. He was mad one day and said, um, I'm not playing anymore. I'm done with it. And it was just very abrupt and that was a very negative thing and that just seemed like that was his world. Why would he do that? But it didn't register because he was binge watching other shows. So I thought, well, maybe he's outgrowing it. You know, he's a freshman in college. You know, so that's something that's new. So it didn't hit me, but it's the activities and the um, that you see them doing on a regular basis, where there's been some shifts and so on, is where we need to ask more questions. I wish that I would have asked more questions, but that's the biggest thing that stood out is just those little tiny little differences. Yeah, the key word I always use is change. When you see change, any change, it, it's the reason for a conversation. You may walk yourself into a conversation that is totally unexpected, or you may be walking yourself into a conversation where you've been there before, and so your child is now going through a transition that it's the first time they're going through this transition, and it gives you an opportunity mm -hmm. to sort of coach them. Either way, change, look for change. I would say too, like um, everything you want to know is on your child's device. So I always encourage parents to monitor, supervise, have an app, something where um, it's doing the work for you. So a lot of times after we have a completion of a suicide or we have you know, something like a school shooting, we look at the students' platforms and typically we find red burning flags and signs of distress and conversations between they and fellow friends or classmates saying like, this is how I'm feeling. Um, and as Paola pointed out, they are great actors and actresses. Um, they are great performers. And so everything that they're doing on their device, there are always clues there as well. And what sort of clues and what ways can parents maybe monitor that? Well, I can tell you, honestly, I've had protections. Um, there's a control panel on the computers um, that basically there is provisions in there. You can actually um, set the times for the allowances and things that they can do on the computer. I did have all of those on there, and there are those apps to send you text messages as a parent to know there's some keywords, things that they're using that are... Um, that whether or they're on a porn site, whether they're using, talking about drugs or what are they, you know, think those kinds of things, it sends a parent a message. And I did um, find that app a long time ago. The one thing that I, I talk to families on a regular basis and nine out of 10 families that I talk to, they have no protection whatsoever on their tablets, on their computers, their laptops, or their cell phones. And that's really, really sad to say. Um, the, the one thing that, um, that wasn't protected is the cell phone that my son bought in his senior year. He's going to college next year, so I can't watch him forever. And I did not put that protection on that cell phone. That's where all the conversations had when he was on Reddit 
talking to a stranger. Um, it was a place that's called a suicide watch. And in that, it's people that are in this bad place that want support, talk with other people that would understand them, understand each other, excuse me. And in that, was talking to a stranger and the conversation was taken in a private chat for 40 days in over 120 pages of dialogue. And um, the guy was suicidal, my son was suicidal, and they're talking about all kinds of things, but what, what was different is that he was herding him like cattle into a certain direction, specifically um, about how to take his life by a gun. My son did not have experiences with guns and um, told him the how to, the what to, and where to point it, um, and all of that was all right there. And at that moment, um, I had four agencies that said they can't do anything because there's no law. So this person got away scot-free, but now we have a law that protects um, you know, other families that there would be a consequence if an adult does talk to a minor about how to self-harm or suicide. And so the, that is, is, it's, it's detrimental to your children if there is no, there, if there's no um, protection of any kind. I wish that I would have done something on there, but honestly, you can't protect your children forever, but if they're in your home and you pay for that cell phone, um, that is your responsibility as a parent. And I can't tell you how many times parents do not want to take the phone away from their child. They'll hate me, they won't talk to me. And I said, that's not it for vote. The vote is you pay for it, it's their privilege, it's your check that you write, and that is as simple as that. And you put the protections. If they don't want to go through that, then get them a flip phone. That's just, that's just, I, I'm sorry, I, that's yeah. the kind of parent I am, but that, I'm just being real with the families out there because we need to take back the control of keeping them protected and opening communication, but to keep them safe on these devices. A lot of these um, cell phone companies do have these protections also that they can put on those settings or pay for $5 or something like that a month. Well, and that's a good point. How do you balance maybe, you know, a sense of independence or them getting mm -hmm. older, going off to college? with still being tuned in, tapped into their lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, a lot of parents say to me, like, I feel like I'm invading their privacy. So some of these apps, Bark being one of them, just alert you on things that you would want to know that are safety issues. So they don't read all of the text messages. They don't, you know, send you the long dissertation text that they're sending to each other. They just alert you to really huge safety issues like predation and grooming and sexting and distress, you know, an uptick and negative self-talk, off-the-cuff comments like, I, my parents wouldn't care if I'm here anymore. That's an alert that would go to the parent's phone. So you can, as Paola said, be all over them. Um, but we do have a due diligence as a parent, I feel, to really make sure that we have some mechanism to know kind of the pulse and behavioral insight into their lives. And these apps allow you to do that really easily and not very expensively. And I, I think that well, Katie and I talked about this a while back, and that is that had I had Bark, um, it would have detected, like it would have been off the off the hook about the conversation that was happening in Reddit because they would talk about the caliber of bullet, the type of gun, the type of angle. Um, there was just, I think, 20 things that Katie was saying that, that would have alerted you right there that something is wrong. Um, even, you know, it, it just would have. It just would have. It would have been nice to have something like that. And for families who might think, oh, a tragedy won't happen to my family, what would you tell them? Let's prepare for it to not. Exactly. Don't, don't wait until the potential for it. Do your best to prepare for it to not happen. Because it's, it's better to be prepared and not need that preparation than to not be prepared and have needed something after the fact. It's, you know, it, it's yeah. so sad when you are talking to a parent or, you know, your heart goes out when, your heart goes out when a parent is in a position where you're, they're saying to you, I never thought that would have been, I, that I would be in this situation. And no parent ever thinks that they're going to be in that situation. So. I, I think yeah. that as a mom, I really feel that um, the suicide doesn't discriminate. Ment mental health does not discriminate to anyone. Um, my son was a valedictorian, had a lot of promise. A lot of these kids in our village have a lot of promise. The thing is, is that I was one of those parents that says, not my kid. 
I'd say to you parents, don't be a member of my club. The conversation starts now, and it doesn't have to be drawn out. But these kids want to build that trust, and they want to trust you with things. But if you're not paying attention, they're not going to come to you. And it took me by storm. It was not something that I expected. And I found a, I'm a member of a club with other parents who lost a child. It is, I promise you, it's not something that you want. But it, it, the conversation can start today. And um, do them privately. That's what I can say is just do them privately and listen more than speaking. I think at the lowest levels too, I mean, there's cyberbullying, there's all sorts of craziness going on online. So not just as it relates to suicide and as Paula said, being part of this club that you don't want to be a part of is um, your kids are facing classmates, best friends, kids that are eating the Oreos out of your pantry that are being awful to each other. And sometimes your kid is being awful. And so these tools are there for you to be able to put golden guardrails in place and guide and navigate and mentor them through these years, right? Um, so it's not a punitive move, it's just a protective factor in their life that I'm giving you this device and you have access to so many people that I know and I don't know. And so I'm gonna put this you know, protective barrier around you and we're gonna have conversations about these alerts that I get. So um, I think some people might hear Paola speak or another parent who lost a child and be like, never, not my kid. But I can tell you, your child will and probably has been bullied. Your child will receive a nude photo. Your child will be asked to vape or smoke pot or worse. Like, it's all happening to every child, no matter who they are. And the one thing I would say is that role playing is something that I've done um, with my kids. And because the, the parents are saying, not my kid, um, maybe not your kid, but your child knows someone that is going through something. And so the role playing where it comes into play is just doing it in the living room and the parents are acting out what it's like to, to have these feelings or a friend if they're not you know, putting the attention on the child. This is how you handle it. I want you to come to me. I, I want you to feel comfortable with that because it's important to protect your friend Friendship comes second. Kids have it in reverse and they protect the friendship versus the person. And that's what happened in my situation with my son. So the role playing, I've been very successful on different other matters about you know, what it's like to, to feel shame, what it feels like um, to be sad, you know, to, so they can identify those markers. Um, so maybe it's not your child. But it is, it's going to, the child is going to be in a circumstance where they're going to know someone or a really good friend that's hurting. And hopefully they have the trust to come to you as the parent. How do I get my friend some help? This is what they said. And do that in confidence. There's, there's some key times when it's a lot easier to have those conversations. Or I, I like to do like a step process. Um, I always have my kids understanding that you're moving to the next level, so we do that. This semester just ended when January begins. You are not the same student that you were when you left school, and so now you're a second semester, whatever grade you're in, and this is what this might look like. So that gives me a chance to just insert whatever that looks like, whatever it looked like for me, and talk about you know who I was as a ninth grader or who I was as an eighth grader. And, and then um, the end of the school year, um, this time of year, because we're in December, many kids are going to get devices uh, for gifts, either a first-time device or a new device. That's another yeah. opportunity. Whatever opportunity you have that is a natural occurrence in their life where you can then insert, here's a coaching tip for you. Here's something that we're going to do. And when we do it step by step, then the kids can expect, okay, this is, this is what this looks like next time. And understanding mom might not be okay Mom might not be okay if you get uh, a, a text from a friend who is asking you to do something that you know I wouldn't like, that you know that mom and dad would not be okay with, but because you're already prepared and we're already having this conversation, you should be okay with telling me that. Things like that, you know, just making sure that you're taking those opportunities to insert your coaching and they are understanding step by step that at different levels, they're gonna experience different things. It should not be a secret that growing up comes with new experiences. 
And sometimes it feels like that. It's, sometimes mm -hmm. it feels like kids think, oh, this has never happened to anyone else before mm -hmm. because it's happened to the, happening to them for the first time. But a parent understands, no, you're growing up. There's even more to come, <laughs> you know? And so take that sheet back a little bit so that they can see like, no, there is, this is normal for changes to happen during life and for new experiences to happen during, during life. And sometimes they're not fun and sometimes they're just ugly. But with that, I'm with you, I'm next to you, I'm, I'm along for the ride with you and I won't be able to protect you from everything. This is why we need a plan in place and step by step we'll learn together. So. And I think that parents, um, we tend to forget that we were teenagers or kids at one time and kids think we have it all together and it's a myth. Um, I think there needs to be more transparency as a parent and the stages in which the children are going through. If they're getting in trouble, I, I'd like to talk to you about something I went through and I didn't tell anybody and I, I want to share this with you because we all make mistakes and having that, bringing down that guard and having that transparency, you get this disbelief and the children is like, you know, I, I, I thought, no, I didn't think you did that kind of a thing. But that also builds that bond and that connection. Not that we're endorsing what happened, it's just that we do make mistakes. It's what are we gonna do now and what are the consequences, you know, in this situation. There's so many teaching moments, but I feel that a lot of us parents are really guarded about our past. And I think we need to start being real. And not, maybe not spilling the soup on everything, but what's appropriate for the conversation you're having right now is more transparency, then we can relate more with our kids. In this time of year around the holidays, a lot of students might be coming home from college or have a couple weeks off from school and parents theoretically might have more time with their children. What are some ways they can approach that opportunity to connect with their kids? Uh, I like taking like a, an article that I read and you know showing them and saying like is this true for you or is this true for your friendship group there's a ton of articles right now about mental health out um, so especially with those college kids I had an opportunity the other day to talk to some moms at ASU and they had heard reports of like four suicides at ASU um, whether or not that's true or not their anxiety was like at an all-time high so their question was how do I talk to my kid about this? And I think you just, you talk very openly, like, hey, I heard there were four suicides. What do you know about suicide? Do you know anybody that struggled like that? Um, I just think communication is key and just really keeping that communication open. And as Paola and Jaronda said, like drive time, ice cream, food, college kids love food. Connecting over those small moments, I think is really key. And don't forget to do it one-on-one -on -one. Mm -hmm. because this is also a time of year where everyone's getting together mm -hmm. and you might have more larger gatherings, you might have more people coming in and out. So don't forget to do those things one-on-one. -on -one. Um, in, a, in a family where there's multiple kids, you know, that one-on-one -on -one time mm -hmm. is, it's just, it's so precious and it doesn't have to be a long time. It could be a quick walk to the mailbox, it could be a walk around the block, it could be in the car drive time, it could be intentional to go sit down and have coffee together or tea or dessert or something, but just do the one-on-one -on -one time so that you get that direct connection and interaction. There is a difference sometimes between the way that people like to interact. Some people like the face-to-face -face interaction. They wanna see your facial expressions and they wanna see what you look like, if that was surprising to you, what I said, and some people don't wanna see that at all, so they prefer to be side by side. You know your child, you know, everyone knows which child is like whatever, and so give it to them the way that they need it and the way that you need it as well. Don't forget about yourself, because that's important. Our reactions sometimes are gonna generate what happens next in the conversation, so also paying attention to ourselves and how we're feeling um, any time of year, but definitely I think when we get to year end, just a lot of things start to maybe reflect, people start to reflect on things and a lot of things start to, um, I don't know, we just get ready for that new year. You know, we're ready to kind of shake off the last year uh -huh. and we get ready for that new year, so pay attention to yourself as well. And I think that, you know, during the holidays, it's that's the one time we see a lot of family once a year kind of a thing. And I would say to the parents is that, please just reconsider overbooking um, your time for those allowances of three or four days that you're with family. I know that some families are, um, parents are under pressure, I've gotta to go to this, I gotta to go to this family if I don't, aunt so-and-so is gonna be upset that I didn't show up and all of that. I'm gonna say, let's be intentional this year about our children. Family, extended family is secondary. 
because right now we need to take advantage of the small piece of time that we have with the kids. And just like they said, is that, you know, with the ice cream date and those kinds of things are very important, but you, you can't have these conversations with auntie in the, or grandmother right there. It's not intimate, they're not gonna open up. It needs to be one-on-one, -on -one. but don't overschedule. And for families in situations where maybe parents are working more or they aren't around or they aren't able to be with their kids as often as they'd like, what would you say to those families? Leave notes. Yeah. Leave notes, literally. I mean, anything you can do to communicate. I think we, we are starving sometime from direct communication. Whatever you can do to directly communicate, that's my, my recommendation. Mm -hmm. um, I like to see the look on my kid's face when they've gotten a note from me or they've gotten something that is mm -hmm directly from me to them you know it just brings a smile and they don't even know that they were going to smile in that moment but just because they picked that up they love that same thing for my husband leaving a little note you know so just just leaving something that's from you your words your authentic caring for them can go a really long way I just brought up a memory um, my husband did this a lot is he'd write little notes and put it in their lunch I didn't know for a while until the kids told me um, but those those are little nuggets, you know. They're they're just precious. So um, I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Now, for parents who might not see any signs, or their child truly might not be struggling in that moment, what are some conversations they should still be having with their teens? I think tackling like the big subjects: the bullying, the drugs and alcohol, the vaping, sexting. Like approaching those subjects with you know, I don't know a ton about this, but do you know? And really sharing in that knowledge, perhaps researching it together, but just opening, the, like, I heard this crazy story about vaping. What do you know about vaping? You know, sometimes I'll even drive by, like, a vape shop, and I'm like, somebody will be standing out vaping. I'm like, what do you guys know about vaping? All I know is it, like, harms your lungs. And then they're, like, chatterboxes. I have four as well. So I learn a lot just from them, just opening the question, tell me more about dot, dot, dot. Um, or help me understand dot dot dot. Um, those are two prompts that I use a lot. And at what point, if you're able to weigh in on this, at what point should a parent maybe seek help? Oh my gosh. Um, Gerard and I both hear from, you know, people, we don't like pain, so we tend to deny, especially if our child's in pain, we tend to dismiss and minimize because it's just easier, like this can't possibly be happening to our family. But the problem with that is if we are so reactive, our crisis resources here in Maricopa County are really limited for teens and tweens. Um, so if your child is struggling and kind of in like the lane of distress, we wanna make sure we move them back to well-being as soon as possible because the slip from distress into crisis is really quick. Mm -hmm. And dialing a kid back from crisis to well-being is a heavy lift and so if you even have like mom dad gut radar going off like something is off seems to be struggling a little bit not bouncing back to well-being get in front of it as soon as possible most of the psychologists psychiatrists pediatricians are booking six to eight weeks out minimum and so getting in front of it is super super important and being in that state of distress, it, you may see, again, that change, but you may see things that are really uh, drastic changes, like they're having a really hard time getting up in the morning or they're having a really hard time getting to, to sleep or staying asleep and they're eating maybe a lot or they're not eating at all, like dr just really drastic changes. It doesn't look the same for every kid, but those changes will be rec should be recognizable that something, something has drastically changed, even when Paula gave the example something was abrupt that abruptness may seem like okay maybe there's a new stage that's happening but it, because it was abrupt it's a drastic change so when you mm -hmm. see that drastic change that definitely could be a sign that well maybe we need to have a conversation and then maybe we can get someone mm -hmm. to help us out and who that is it could vary it could be the pediatrician it could be just based on the situation whatever's happening maybe a pet is sick or a pet is injured or a friend is moving away or it, there could be a lot of scenarios that might create that um, but having that conversation to find out what is creating that gives you an idea of what then should happen next who then should be brought in I think the other thing that that I I've talked with other parents and um, 
We don't necessarily have to wait until there is a problem. I find that if the kids are in that transition from sixth grade going to junior high, it's, that's a good opportunity to do a check-in um, and get them acquainted with like, a counselor. Um, just simply um, to let as a parent to the child know that when we go through these changes it's kind of scary um, there's just things that we're, we're going to go through and just having some answers to be prepared is helpful and if they're able to start that relationship with the therapist it might be once every three years that they need to see one but the thing is is they're not going to be scared to talk about it so there's a junior high to high school there's going to be a huge transition in those two points and they're already at this place so I have a client um, that they're going through a major major life change and the child is I think sixth grade um, and I told her what I thought would be a good thing and the daughter is talking um, to a counselor. She doesn't have any major issues or anything like that, but she's building this rapport. Um, there is gonna be a significant life event that's gonna happen and she's gonna need the support. So it's getting ahead of it, um, you know, because whether the kid knows that they're going through anxiety or depression, the counselor can help facilitate and get, ask those questions to be able to get that conversation going. Um, I think that parents sometimes take offense when the child doesn't want to come to talk to them. Um, endorse a, a trusted adult that they know, or the pastor, or um, you know, a, a trusted um, family member, because it's more it's better that the child is talking to a trusted adult than talking to a stranger on the internet or talking to their peers, because the peers are not equipped to deal with real life circumstances and they need these tools now. We have to like destigmatize help seeking, which means adults have to model for them like it's okay not to be okay and it's okay to go talk to a counselor. Like I think that this generation in particular they're totally inclusive, civically oriented. We've never seen a generation that's so active civically and they have social media and they want a voice at the table. Um, what they're doing is coming to us saying, I'm anxious, I'm depressed. So they're coming in droves and schools and parents are saying, whoa, 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 whoa. We didn't think you needed this much help. We don't have the resources. So we've kind of sent a double mixed message that like, it's okay not to be okay, come to us. And when they come to us, we're like, whoa, we don't have enough, enough help. So that is part of this whole system of having an emotional blueprint of what to do. Like in kindergarten, we teach them how to stop, drop, and roll. Mm -hmm. What these children need is how do you stop, drop, and roll out of your emotional pain? What does that blueprint look like? True, and so, um, you know, it's been 31 months now that my son's been gone, and we created the Lala Boy Foundation, and in that we give um, free counseling stipends for families that are um, in financial need. And I built some relationships with other counselors in the Valley that heard about us and said, we want to work with you. Um, so what we basically do is pay up to um, three counseling stipends, that's $300. So if a counseling uh, hourly rate is 125, that's scary for a lot of families. That's the first thing that goes on the budget is counseling because they can't afford it. Well, we're able to help in that and we also have connections with other groups that have other resources um, that can also help outside of counseling. Um, the, the, the first thing is to make the phone call. It's a one-page application, it's very simple. The turnaround time for a response if you get the award is within 48 hours. Um, but the stop talking to your neighbor or talking to other people, you do what you feel that's best. You're the parent and if you feel that there is a need for your child, make the phone call. There's so many stigmas out there and the shaming and, and all of that, we need to cancel that. That was the old school of thought when we were back years and years ago. It's different now, the climate's different. And so we're here to aid in the family and help that child um, regarding the counseling. So that, that's what we do here in the Valley. So our funds are for the state of Arizona, not just Phoenix metro area. Um, after having my fourth child, I realized that no one was monitoring youth mental health um, regularly you can go and get wellness visits annually and when you have a young infant uh, you will get regular checks even more you know scheduled and so I started looking into well how do I monitor my kids mental health in a way that um, ha there, there's a tool that would really show me what is happening here and there are tools out there 
So I created this initiative called Neck Up Checkup, and really what it is is just go and get a tool, find a tool that will help you to monitor your kids' mental health. You can take that survey monthly, you can take it when you see that something has happened, it's like a thermometer. You know, you go and you want to stick a thermometer in their mouth because you think, oh, your eyes look a little glassy or you feel warm to me. So you put a thermometer in their mouth to give you an accurate reading of what their temperature is. And that's what mental health checks are. They give you an accurate reading of what the mental health temperature is. And so do that. Do that regularly and keep track of it. And at the least, you have more information to pass on to the next professional that will just help them understand what's been going on over the last year or two or a couple months or weeks. So that's my, that's my offering of please do that. Please do regular mental health checks. My standard is how can I help? And my favorite opener is what's been your favorite thing and your least favorite thing. You can say over the last week or month or the school year. That's my favorite. I would, I would say that dinner table conversations, whether it's Christmas time right now or just in general, it's just like, just asking just one question and then getting everybody's response on that. Um, it just, those are icebreakers, if you will, in any setting. Maybe not so much on Christmas because you're gonna have 20 people giving an opinion. It, that child that's maybe hurting may not wanna talk about it because every, the consensus is it's, it's not real, you know. Um, just be present and listen. I think, you know, with my four daughters, they say, like, sometimes they just want to vent. They don't want me to offer strategies, right? So my goal is to get them to come up with their own strategies. So sometimes I'll say, is this just a listening moment, or do you want to strategize? And most of the time, like 90% of the time, like, I just need you to listen. So sometimes as parents, we try to fix because we want everything to be better. Um, but that's the heavy lifting that they need to do for themselves. I think for me, it's about, thanks so much for trusting me with this. I know this was hard and I'll be the bridge. I may not have all the answers, but I'm here. And I'll go off of what, uh, what you were saying to begin with. It's a, do you want me to say something here now to give you a response or would you like me to just continue to listen? And then when we're at a point where there's a break, whatever answer I get, then would you like to go get something to eat? <laughs> so, Lots of always. food. <laughs> food is always. Exactly. Yeah. I, I, I definitely um, agree with the two of them. I, I think um, getting that permission to, to share something, uh, it empowers them that they do have control in that moment that they are sharing. And I think that um, I'm going to walk this with you. I'm going to walk this with you. Um, I'm glad that you shared that. That was, I don't know how hard that was, but I feel that it was hard. And, and just validating, because we're not validating our kids. It's not making our kids um, wimpy. It's, it's, it's not, and I think that's the wrong message that a lot of people believe. It's, it's just, we're just saying we're hearing them. We're with them, and we'll find solutions together. That's what they need.